there's no better way to learn something than to teach somebody. And if you can explain something to somebody that they can understand themselves, then you've accomplished something. And, and I get a lot of joy out of doing that. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of the iOS Dev Podcast. In this episode, we had Stuart Lynch join us. Stuart has been playing around with Apple products since they first came out in the 70s. And he's currently an indie developer that also makes content on YouTube. And I hope you guys enjoy. When did uh, your fascination with technology start? Um, probably when I got my first calculator. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, you know, that may sound strange, but uh, you, you can tell I'm pretty old. So it was uh, probably in uh, about 1969 when my, my father brought me uh, mm -hmm. a calculator as I just started university. So um, up until that point, we were using slide rules and uh, <laughs> to do all your calculations. So, uh, and this was a four function calculator. So it wasn't anything special. I mean, there was no trigger or anything like that, but it certainly helped me, uh, helped me do some oh, calculations. Oh, it was like a standard calculator? Like it wasn't like a TI or something like that? No, those things didn't exist, no. Oh. No, no. <laughs> oh, it was just a four function calculator. It was pretty yeah. big. So that, so that, that was pretty cool because, um, you know, the technology just wasn't there. Cause when I, I started university in, in 1969 mm -hmm. and there was no computer science department. So I was in the math department. I got my degree in mathematics. So I just started, um, they had computer science courses, but those were, they were theoretical, but there was their programming, but you had to do them on punch cards. So we had to, um, you know, type in on our punch cards and submit the stack of cards to be batch processed. Right. And there's, yeah. so there was no real time checking for, for typos. <laughs> so you submit this batch and three hours later you get it back and you'd made a typo. So you got to find that card. And then the worst <laughs> thing was if you dropped your cards, because then they got all of the sequence, right? So you used to have to uh, take a, like a felt pen and draw a diagonal line along the felt card so that you knew that if they're stacked, you knew that they were in order. And if they weren't, you could tell because of the diagonal line that the, the, it was out of, out of, uh, you know, out of alignment. Yeah. Well, Those were good times. <laughs> yeah. That's a very interesting uh, way of debugging, right? Like, just... yeah, they, I mean, you had to be really yeah. careful with your code for sure. Yeah. And what, what language was it written in? It was Fortran. Ah. Yeah. And what resources were there to like learn? <laughs> um, books. You know, there, there were, there were books available. I mean, you know, there was textbooks and course books, but there was no, there was no online presence. This was yeah. pre-internet, right? So there yeah. was there was nothing. There was no bulletin boards. There was there was nothing. So you you just had to rely on your local community, and and that was it. After after college, I'm guessing you wanted to do something in tech, but at that point, was was there anything like there was no tech industry really, right? There was no, not really. Um, there wasn't a, a big huge community or demand for, for, for tech and IT. So I, uh, I did get my degree in mathematics and then I went and worked for an insurance company in data processing. And, and that was really boring. So I went back to school and um, got my teaching certification and, and went to teach uh, high school mathematics, among other things. So I did that. Uh, I, I actually taught for in the classroom for 12 years, but it was during that time that, that, Computers were sort of introduced. They, there was the Apple IIe's, there was the Commodore 64's that started to make their way into schools. And so we got maybe three in our school and I would manage to get one. So I got that into my classroom and immediately started coding uh, and writing in, in what was called AppleSoft Basic at that time. It was an Apple IIe. So I started to, I wanted to create some uh, applications that my students could use to help them to learn concepts in math. So, yeah. you know, there was some basic stuff, you know, multiplication tables and things like that. You may, you know, just, you know, n nothing exciting, but then um, you could do graphics. So I was starting to teach graphing techniques by plotting on the screen and be able to move different parameters around and show different sine waves and, and, and things like that. And it was just, I don't know if I if I made an impact or not, but it was really it was a lot of fun. So that's where I sort of get got really back into the tech part of it again. And it was I was right there on the ground floor because there was no computers in schools. So as they started to come into schools, I started to play a more active role. So I ended up having 
getting moved out of the classroom into a district position to help uh, other teachers be able to incorporate technology into their classrooms. And so I just sort of worked my way up through the education system in, in leadership roles responsible for technology and, and ended up going to two different school districts and being directors of technology responsible for technology and education and in the business sector as well. Yeah. But the whole time, I'm always coding. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And was the, did they all have like internet access or? No, um, no. When I first started, there was no internet access. Um, so what we ran was, what was, uh, are you familiar with bulletin board systems? Bulletin board Does systems. that sound I familiar think, at yeah. all to you? Wait, okay, it was maybe. sort of the, it was the precursor because we had modems, right? And the first internet, when internet, when the first, when the internet first was introduced, everybody had to use a modem to dial into a central internet provider and you could get a 2400 baud or a 1200 but we started out with 300 baud modem connection so it really really slow so it was mostly just text based um but there were systems out there that were called bulletin board systems where you could host a bank of modems on a server and it would be a collaboration communication system where people could dial in and communicate so you'd still be limited to a maximum of 12 people um so, you know, you were very economical in terms of how off, how long you stayed on and you just went on, got your messages, got off again. So that 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 was sort of the introduction. So I ran this bulletin board system, but then that's when the internet started. And so I was able to have an intermediary sort of component to this system that allowed us to go using an SMTP protocol to go out and grab internet messages and have them brought back into this system. So it was a bridge between our local system and the internet as well. And then everything just sort of took off once we got, you know, uh, wide area networks in place and those were all replaced and, and uh, everything just grew from there. So, and, yeah. And throughout that time, what was like, what would you say was the coolest project or thing you built while playing around? Well, I think it, 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 it was working with this bulletin board system because this, it was a, a system out of Canada that became very popular in the education. And they had a, a, um, a development system that allowed you to create applications on top of that system. So I was able to develop all sorts of applications that allowed me to, within that system, query internal database systems to provide information to our users, school system information, marks, uh, and, and, and it became the conduit to that. So I, I became pretty active in that particular community and so much so that the company ended up paying for my time from the school district one day a week so that I could um, travel about the U.S. because this was even before WebEx and things like that where you had to go places. So I did a lot of traveling doing presentations to different school districts and different companies on, on that particular software. And eventually they made me an offer that I couldn't refuse that they hired me Full time, so I left the education sector and went and worked for the software company that was based out of uh, the Toronto area in, in Canada. I worked from home, but and at that point, I was developing a lot of uh, third party or value added tools that would run on top of the system. I became um, sort of the conference speaker for for them on their user group meetings and different conferences. So they had offices in in Sweden. And in Germany, so I did a lot of, uh, of travel and work over over in Europe as well. Yeah. So it was a it was a, a progression. So that whole inroad into that system got me going and took me further into into tech because I I always think that I was sort of like ten or fifteen years behind my time. You know, if I had, if I had, if I was starting out now, I know what I'd be doing. But back then, you know, there just wasn't it wasn't there, right? Yeah, the infrastructure wasn't there for. No, exactly. Yeah. And was that uh, were you using uh, Mac or Apple products all the time, or what, did you dabble no, with um, Windows? You know, I was always a Mac, uh, an Apple person. Yeah. Then we went Macintosh. This uh, bulletin board system, the it was Windows based at the time, although they had a Mac client. The server was window based, and the development environment was window based. So there, so there must have been about. 10, 12 years there where I was primarily using Windows uh, in my work, but I always had a Mac and I always used a Mac at home. 
And then, of course, things got better. I mean, there was a period of time in around 1995, 96, when you didn't know if Apple was going to survive, right? It was, it was after Steve Jobs left. They had uh, they were down to their last, you know, million dollars worth. And, and so there was a real prediction that they just weren't going to survive. So, uh, you know, you, you got to hedge your bets and, and go with where you think uh, where the direction are. But fortunately, that turned around and uh, and everything got better after that. Right. Yeah. And fast forwarding. From from working like that job with the bulletin board company. Yeah. When did you start messing around and playing around more with like the current Apple products like the Mac book or the iPhone and the iOS? Yeah, so that job, I they the, the company was acquired by a larger company, and like what often happens with larger companies, what they'll do is they'll they'll take what they can out of a smaller company and then just discard that company. So what happened was they they took those resources. There's a number of layoffs. I survived three layoffs, and then in 2014, I got laid off. Now in 2014. I was, I was 63 in 2014, right? So I was pretty old. So there was no way I was going to get another job with anybody else. But it just so happens that, that coincided with the introduction of Swift. Yeah. And <laughs> and I had been playing around with uh, because I had an iPhone, and iPhones hadn't been out for that long. And but I had an iPhone. And I was dabbling in Objective-C, but it just wasn't sticking with me. It just wasn't what I was doing. I was doing a lot of JavaScript. And when Swift was introdu introduced, that whole syntax was very similar to what I was used to in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So when it was released in, in 2014, within about six months, I had an app on the App Store. And, I, and I was, that was just when I was laid off. So I had all this time in my hands. My wife didn't want me hanging around doing you know, <laughs> nothing bothering her. And I hate housework and I hate uh, yard work. So I want, I, I, I'm an office person. I sit in my office and, and, and do stuff. So I just started to build apps. And, and so I, with it, you know, since 2014, I think I've got, I have 12 apps that I've put on the app store. 11 of them, of them are still there, but they're all basically built to, you know, satisfy a need of my own or, or a, an inquiry of my own. I wanted, if I wanted to learn a new framework or something, mm -hmm. I'd think of a project that would force me to get into that framework and, and, uh, and, and develop an application. Or I saw something that was on the app store that didn't quite do what I wanted it to do. So I figured, okay, I'll build it myself. So um, that's what really got me going. You know, in 2014, I had nothing else to do. I thought I'd better get involved in, in, in coding and, and, and building stuff and just staying active. And did any of those see like any success? Did you get app of um, the day or something? <laughs> no, no, because I'm I'm really bad at promoting. And um, to be honest with you, they, they they, I've got maybe three or four apps that are that are active, still making me some money. Not an awful lot of money, but you know, coffee money and and paying for 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 some things. And I use them all the time myself. Um, but I don't promote them. Uh, I'm constantly updating them, changing them. You know, I'm working on, you know, my biggest app is my my wine cellar app, you know, because I, I drink a lot of wine. So I man, I have a wine cellar and I manage my wines in and out. And I'm on my third revision of it now. And I'm it was built initially using Realm as the, the back end in UIKit. Uh, then last year, I, I changed it and converted it to Core Data and Swift UI. But now I'm right in, in the middle of trying to figure out, okay, it's going to have to get switched over to Swift data, yeah. you know, and the new APIs that are available in, in iOS 17. So no, it, will I ever promote it and, and really flog it? it? You know, it's got lots of great reviews. It's got five-star reviews, uh, 4.7 or something on the app store, but what's the, the main functionality of it? And like it's for, um, it, it, you manage your, your, you can input all your wines and it, it lets you know how many that you have in your cellar. So it, it's only good for people who, who maintain a fair number of wines, but it, it also gives you your statistics on, on what varieties you have, uh, when are they best, when should they best be drunk? What are your tasting notes? What it's information about the wineries that you visited? You know, it, it just a full 
full meal deal on on managing your wine. Yeah. Well, that's but pretty if you cool. don't drink wine, especially, yeah, especially, if you enjoy wine, then you might you might really love it. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I say. So you know, and I have another app that's called My Bookshelf because I like to read books. So it uh, you know you can it does a a Google search API search that you can search by barcode or scan a barcode and it'll bring the book in. And so you can have a wish list of which books you want to read, which books you have read, which authors, so that you can just sort of do a search for. And uh, so if you forget what the book was all about, you can bring it up and it'll have that Google summary of the book and, and what notes you may have done on your own. And I have another one that's called my scorecard for, for golfing, where I can track all of my different rounds and see if I improve over time on, on golf. But I've given up golf now, so I don't really make <laughs> use of that. Yeah. And how did you start with the um, like YouTube and creating iOS and Swift content? Yeah, that I guess it was with just after Swift UI was released. It was brand new for everybody, and at that point, it was just at that point I was on a podcast with uh, Sean Allen. He used to do a uh, ah. iOS. Um, I was going to say iOS Dev podcast, but that's what yours is. Yeah. But he would he would interview different people yeah. about their experience, and no, I didn't. Nobody knew me, and but you know, I, I like everybody else. I follow all of the people, and I was following Sean Allen and and um, Paul Hudson and all these people, and he was interviewing different people. And so I just contacted him. I says, "Look, I think you what you should really do is interview somebody who isn't." a big time iOS developer and somebody who is just sort of in the weeds like I am and, and uh, basically more of a hobbyist kind of a person just learning on their own. So, you know, we had a, had a good conversation and, and the conversation came around about SwiftUI because SwiftUI had just been released and he wasn't jumping on the bandwagon at that point. And, and I was because I didn't have a job that, that depended on me, you know, knowing Objective-C or Swift. And so at that point, I started to realize that I, for the last, you know, I don't know how many years, five years prior to that, when I'm developing code, I really wasn't sort of structured in how I was doing that. And, and I was doing a lot of copying and pasting, but not really understanding what I was doing uh, and, and understanding what was really going on in my code. So if I go back and take a look at some of my old code bases, it's really tough to understand and, and figure out. So if I ever have to do any fixes, it, it's not not that particularly easy. And I think you'll find that a lot with people with their first projects. They're terrible. Yeah, yeah. And mine are terrible yeah. as anybody else's are. <laughs> I mean, they're all running and and you know, there's no bugs that are are, are deal breakers at this point. But um try I look at the code and I think, well, why did I do that? There's a way better way of doing that now. And so with the teaching background, and because of when I worked for the the other company, I used to run um, tutorials on their YouTube channel. And I, would, I was their person who did um, sort of tips and tricks on how to use that, their particular product. I thought, okay, well, here's some things that I've learned. Let me start to create some videos and hopefully, you know, people will, will watch them. And so that's sort of what started it. And I just decided that, okay, I'm going to do, do one a week. And just to see, you know, if I can maintain that pace. And so it's been, I don't know, has it been three years now or something like that where, you know, I've been putting out videos one a week and it's slow and steady. The difference is that, that I'm not here to sort of uh, necessarily, I'm not here to get a job. So I'm not creating videos to show people what I know. My main goal is to help people understand particular concepts probably a little bit deeper. So there are two different types of people that watch my video videos, those that really like them and those that tell me to hurry up because I'm really <laughs> slow. So I just tell those people, well, watch me yeah. at three times the speed, <laughs> you know, because if you don't like, don't like it, there's, there are a ton of really good people that put out YouTube content and nobody can learn from one person only. And sometimes yeah. I'll click with people and sometimes I won't. And, you know, that's just how it is. So um, I, you know, I really enjoy it because, I've learned so much. So since in the last three years, I think my skills and my ability to understand concepts in, in Swift and Swift UI has, has improved, you know, tremendously because there's no better way to learn something than to teach somebody. And if you can explain something to somebody that they can understand themselves, 
then you've accomplished something. And, and I get a lot of joy out of doing that. And would you say that really helped you with changing or f I don't want to say fixing, but helping your code be better than it was when you were first developing the other apps, like you mentioned? Oh, no question. Absolutely no question. Because, you know, in the past it was, if I couldn't figure out something, you know, I'd go on Stack Overflow and I'd get a piece of code and I'd copy that code and I'd paste it in and I would just sort of tweak a few parameters or, or whatever in there until something worked. And if it worked, I just hoped that it would never break again, but I had no understanding what I was doing. So now, you know, my policy is that I won't implement any code unless I understand exactly what's going on behind the scenes. So I love, I like to dig into the Apple documentation and, and just drill down a bit and, and see all the hidden gems that are, that are actually there in that documentation. And I try to introduce parts of that in, in my videos as well, because I think that's really important. It's a, it's a really important skill to have is to, to understand what Apple's doing and, and their, their documentation and their examples sometimes aren't all that clear. So, um, you know, it's, it's quite a skill to have, I think, and it's really helped me a lot. And what would you recommend for like early developers who are still learning on how they can improve theirs? Well, I think there's no better resource than Paul Hudson's hundred days of, of Swift or Swift UI. Um, so, you know, when, when people ask, ask me and I mentor a number of people and, and I think that, that what you have to do is you have to get a, a complete overview of, of, of as much as you can off the bat. Um, you know, you may have, <clears throat> excuse me, you may have a project in mind, but unless you really understand the whole ecosystem, you're not really going to understand how to put it all together. So, you know, spend the time. I mean, it does, it's not necessarily going to take you 100 days to get through Paul Hudson's uh, material because you can go through one or two a day. Some are going to take you a full day. Some may take you two days to get through and understand. But once you've gone through that, then at least you've got this full overview of, of what's possible, what you might want to put into your particular project and, and still go from there and start small. Don't start big and always break your project up into smaller pieces and have multiple projects related to the one that you're building. So for example, if, when I'm building any new app, I will break up each, comp each component into its own little individual app. And then I'll build just a prototype essentially of that particular component until I get it to work. And then I'll bring it into my app. And so the whole thing is always, it's, it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you build little pieces, put them all together, knowing what you want to do in the end. And, um, you know, that's just the best way to do it, I think. Well, what project are you currently working on? Are you, are, I think you mentioned earlier you were trying to transition one of the apps to Swift Data, right? I, yeah, and it's on, a bit on hold right now because there are still some deficiencies in Swift Data. I'm hoping that a, that a new uh, beta is going to come out that's going to have some, some fixes. I do have the, the core data version that's working well now, but... I always want to try and stay up to date. So I'm always going to be switching things. I'm, I'm want to try to implement some of the new animation uh, features that were introduced in iOS 17. Um, but because I've always got a video that I got to get out this week, you know, I'm, there's, there's always, I'm always trying to think of, okay, what other topic am I going to be digging into this week and what kind of a side project can I put together? Because rather than sort of teaching something in isolation, I need to have a, 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 a starter project, just about every one of my videos has a starter project that, that I can work on. And then in the end, I've got something that I can refer back to because, you know, with over 250 odd videos, um, I, I, if I'm, if I am trying to implement something and I forget how to do it, I'll do a search for it. And more often than not, I'll find one of my videos in my search that I'll watch <laughs> again. <laughs> and I thought, I didn't realize I knew that before. Because uh, it, unless you work with this stuff all the time, you, you don't remember it. Mm -hmm. And so my videos for me are, are more kind of no, my notebook to myself so that if I need to do something, hopefully I've been thorough enough. See, hopefully I'm get, I've been thorough enough in it that I'm going to be able to uh, demonstrate to people how to do it. And I'll be able to learn myself from myself in the future self or from my past self. <laughs>
Yeah, it's always funny. Cause I, I think I had that a few times where like you were trying to solve a problem and you were, oh, I've done this before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then it's well, yeah, very I keep easy. All of my, I keep all of my side projects around for all of my videos. And I'm constantly going back and taking a look at that code and and oftentimes improving it. I've got a couple of videos that I've redone two or three times each time improving on the previous one, you know. So yeah, I mean I'm I mean I'll be working on another video um next month on the new observation framework and that'll be the third one in the sort of the swift you know state state object you know that whole data flow transition because it's changed drastically since the very first version right so you're always 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 changing things and always improving and what are your thoughts on the vision pro um you know what i'm not even touching it uh, oh. Because, first of all, it's way too expensive. It's not going to be available in Canada initially anyway, uh, U.S. only. And I really don't see a huge market for myself. I can't see myself, I can't see myself wearing one. It, it's, it's not something that, that really makes me jump up and down. Although, you know, listening to people like Paul Hudson or Malin Soonberg or or uh, Jordi Brun talk about how great the experience was. Uh, to me, it'd be like you know doing paragliding or something. I might put it on and and yeah. uh, enjoy it once, but after that, I just can't see myself putting this thing on my head. Now, having said that, things can change in a couple of years. But let's face it, I don't have that many years left. So, uh, <laughs> I, you know, wh what am I going to spend my time on? And and I don't think you know I'm going to jump in on the the Vision Pro bandwagon at this point. I'm not dismissing it and saying it's not going to be the next great thing. It could very well be, but I just don't think the time is right. So I, if, if anything, I'll, I'll wait a couple of years or wait a year and see cheaper versions come down, you know, what the, the killer apps are, see what other people are doing with it and then jump in. But for what I do, for the tutorials that I create, there's not going to be an awful lot of people who watch my videos that are going to be really interested in, in vision, you know, vision pro or, or the vision, uh, vision framework. Right. But yeah, I think especially initially it's going to be a little tricky, I would say, because like the price point and then it's only the U.S. market. And my initial um, observation is I don't see the like the utility yet, like where it'll be useful to use every day, maybe as like a laptop, because I, I think I saw like you could use it as a workspace. That That's the only thing. That, I mean, I've got a, what have I got a? 36 inch monitor and then another one vertically as well. I mean, it's kind of nice. I would love to be able to have this whole screen in front of me <laughs> and, uh, you know, and be able to move things around. I mean, that would be great. Uh, but you know, you remember, I don't know, it, it's got a battery pack. I don't know if you can pack, if you can plug that battery pack in to be always connected or not, because the battery pack is only two hours, right? Yeah. So that's that's really not sufficient. It's not even long enough to really watch a watch a decent movie. Couldn't watch Avatar, for example. Uh, it's just too long. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's just a bit too restrictive for me. You know, put a helmet on your head and uh, and, and, and and you know engulf yourself. But you know, I the last thing I want to do is be like one of those guys that said you know when the iPhone came out and said that Apple missed the boat. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to be recorded on a, on a live podcast that saying that this is crap. It could very well be the next best thing, but I don't want to be, uh, I'm not jumping on yeah. board right now. Yeah. And I saw, I was looking into your blog and I saw you mentioned something about self-taught versus self-directed. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's a term that I use and some people didn't like it when I said that, uh, at, at one point. What, uh, I, I won't mention his name, but a, a, a very well-known and respected developer who also has a YouTube channel. He hasn't been all that active recently. I talked about being a self-learning self or self-taught developer. And I didn't mean any disrespect, but I says, you know, I like to say self-directed rather than self-taught because most of us don't teach ourselves. We get resources and we learn from other people. So really what we're doing is we're directing our learning. So it's just semantics, you know. I I I just like the term self-directed because I I want to always give credit to those people that have showed me the way, 
And so I'm not learning in isolation. I'm learning from other people. And so I initially when I started out, you know, I watched an awful lot of videos from a lot of people that are no longer active. I have a huge subscription list of, of, of people that I that I subscribe to on YouTube, but uh, you know, a lot of them, as I say, aren't aren't all that active anymore or have moved on to to different things. And um, without them, I couldn't have done what I do, what I did. I couldn't have built those first 12 apps because they showed me the way. Um, so, you know, I'm there. I'm, I'm just directing where I'm going. Uh, although, and I said that now, the more I become competent in being able to read and understand Apple's documentation, perhaps more and more I am more becoming a self-taught learner rather than a self-directed but uh so maybe i was wrong in saying that you know you're you weren't self-taught you're or you you know you were self-directed but i think it's a very rare person that can start from scratch and teach themselves how to do something yeah. they have to be taught by other people and they have to direct that learning and find the best resources for themselves yeah yeah and i think all of like technology and all of our investments as like a society have been built upon each other. Absolutely. And you know what? The iOS community is, is absolutely fantastic. And, you know, I, the, the, the number of people that, that share and are openly willing to share their own content. I mean, it's, it's just a fabulous community. I mean, I, I, I don't know what else to, uh, to, to say about it. I mean, I, I've, I'm on, I'm on Twitter. And I thought that Twitter was the greatest thing for, for content. More and more now, the content that I consume is on Mastodon. I'm still on both. Um, and I have way more followers on, on Twitter than I do on Mastodon. So I still post my own content on Twitter. And I think more people find my content on Twitter. But I find more content from other people on Mastodon than I do on Twitter. And, and it's sort of this... This challenge now is to, you know, where do I spend my time? Um, and it gives, because I consume an awful lot of material every morning. Um, and, I, and I use, uh, no, are you familiar with Notion? Yeah. As a, and Notion has a, uh, oh, um, a share extension for the Mac and for um, iPhones and iPads. So anytime I see a an article, a web uh, link, or YouTube video, there's a share link that I can just click on, and it will add another entry into one of my Notion documents. So for example, when I was um, putting together, uh, when, as I'm trying to gather information for my next 20 videos, which will all be on iOS 17 and WWDC 23 kind of content, there's an awful lot of people putting out a lot of content right now. And, you know, it's still a, a moving target. Things are still changing, but I want to try and get everybody's viewpoint on how things work so that I can put together my own version of a particular concept. So I'm marking, so I've got something like 50 different resources already on WWDC 23 content. But before that, I have another document that just every time I read something, I don't, or, or I, I find something, I don't necessarily read it. I'll essentially bookmark it into a Notion document so that now when I'm looking for an idea for a video, I've got all these different resources that I can go back into and, and try and find the information about them. And if I use any of that person's content, first, if I use a significant amount of their content, I'll contact them first and say, look, it, I really liked your approach. Do you mind if I use that approach in one of my videos? And generally speaking, people are, are happy to do that and I'll give them credit in the video. Or I'll, I'll always reference their links in my videos as well. So, um, if they're generous enough to share their their content, it's worth sharing uh, that knowledge uh, with other people that that follow me as well. And where would you say the biggest um, iOS community is? Because, like you mentioned, now like some people are leaving Twitter, and then recently even Reddit, like Reddit had some issues and people were like leaving. Yeah, uh, to me, it's Mastodon. All of the people that that are. Yeah, I, I think with the exception of maybe one or two, the people that, that produce content that I like to consume, they're all on Mastodon. And, you know, these are people who are on sort of on the cutting edge of things that are, 
are releasing content. Now, many of them are still posting on, on Twitter as well, but some aren't. So um, that's, those are the kind of people that, that, that I'm getting my content from. But, you know, I, I only have a thousand or so followers on, on Mastodon and 8,000 or so on, on Twitter. So if I'm going to post a, my, my videos, I'm going to make sure it's on Twitter because a lot of people who are just starting out, Mastodon is a bit intimidating for them or they're not going to find the kind of content that they want on Mastodon. Yeah, I haven't joined it yet. Like I was, I've been looking at it, but it's kind of the, like the U, UX is kind of weird. And like, it's an adjustment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I use, um, fortunately, when I, was, when I was active on Twitter, I used a product called Spring. And it was a Twitter client. And he produced a Mastodon client called Mona. So they're exactly the same. So oh. <laughs> my transition from Twitter to to Mastodon was was easy. So if you used um, Tweetbot, I guess it was on Twitter, then you can use Ivory on Mastodon, and you'll have sort of the same experience. So yeah. once you once you get in and you understand the whole Fediverse and the different uh, um, spaces that are there, it, it's basically a non-entity. You just search for somebody, you follow them, and the best way to to find out who to follow is find someone on Mastodon that that you had followed on Twitter and take a look at who they're following. And that the first thing I did was um, Paul Hudson said, I'm on Mastodon. I go to Paul Hudson's uh, Mastodon profile. I took a look at all the people he's following. I thought, oh, yeah, I know him. I know him. I started to follow all of them. And then somebody else comes on that I really admire. And I say, well, who are you following? Ah, oh, I like that person too, that person too. So I built my whole follow list on Mastodon based on who everybody else is following that that I you know that I follow, and I think that's a that's a good technique. So if anybody is looking for someone to or looking for content on Mastodon, is find one person that you know that is a prolific um, contributor in the iOS community. Find out who they follow, and you start following those people as well, and then just start building your list that way. And what were the the clients that you recommended? The client apps. Well, Mona and Ivory are probably and Ice Cubes and what's the third the other one um, that oh I can't even remember. But 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 certainly Ivory and Mona are the two of the yeah. biggest ones I think. All right, I'll I'll look them up and I'll get up I'll get up on um, Macedon. That's what yeah it's called. Yeah, you should. Because uh, there's a there are a lot of people now that are no longer posting on Twitter, like Daniel Steinberg, uh, Dim Sum Thinking. He's I think he's pretty much exclusively on Mastodon now, and there's a number of others as well that are 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 just there. And uh, I think you you'll miss out because my Twitter feed has actually dropped the number the amount of uh, or the number of of posts that I I read on Twitter now has dropped significantly and increased on Mastodon. So, and I haven't stopped following anybody on Twitter, but they're just not posting there anymore. I like to end off like on, on a random question. And you mentioned earlier, you really like wine and books. So what are your yep. favorite, what's your favorite wine and what's your favorite book? Well, the great, I like Chardonnays. I've sort of come back, you know, there was a day, a time back in the, uh, in the eighties that Chardonnays got a bad rep because there was so much oak, but they've come around now. So I'm, I'm really into Chardonnays and Merlots on, on the, the red side. Um, it, the, I don't have a, a particular um, winery. I just like them all. Uh, yeah. And, in, and as far as books go, books I'm, I'm most interested in are sort of, sort of detective kind of novels. I read a lot of, um, of uh, Scandinavian um detective genres this uh, joe nesbo or uh um you know the oh what's the that whole series the uh <laughs> girl with the dragon tattoo i don't know if you heard of that but anyway i think so. i think so De yeah it, it, just detective kind of novels it, it, nothing too serious I, because i do a lot of technical reading i read a lot of of books i'll buy i buy a ton of books pay for a lot of resources i I support a number of people on on uh, GitHub, their coffee, their Patreon. Um, 
so I consume a lot of content. So my reading is always just sort of fiction that is just out there, but particularly detective kind of novels. Yeah. But, and what's your favorite technical book then? Um, I don't know if I have any, any favorite ones. Um, because I, I mean, I have every one of Paul Hudson's books and I've got, just about every one of the uh, Kodako or the Ray Wenderlich books uh, that are yeah, those iOS are really good. development books, which, by the way, is interesting because when I first started um, doing this, I signed up with with um, Ray Wenderlich, which is Kodako now, and a lot of their books. I mean, they're really good, but I find that they jump in too far, too fast into too technical stuff. So their sample projects. They say, well, here, here's what we're working on. But if you look at the code, it is really sophisticated. And it was way too sophisticated for me at the time. Now it's great because I go back there and I read that and says, ah, that's how you do this. This is the best way of doing things. But at that point, when I first started going out and, and getting their books and some of their more advanced books, it was way over my head. Yeah. And, um, but now, uh, oh, but I remember I know, my favorite technical author is um, Mark Moykins, Big Mountain Studio, and his um, uh, Swift UI View Mastery, his Combined Mastery, his Core Data Mastery books. I don't know if you've ever experienced any of uh, Mark Moykins' books, uh, but they're they're fantastic. I'll send you a All link. All right, I'll, I'll give it a look then. Yeah, and I appreciate you for coming on. Where can the people find and follow you? Well, they can follow me. My my name is is Stuart Lynch S T E W A R T L Y N C H, so I'm at Stuart Lynch in just about everywhere, uh, YouTube, Twitter, and Mastodon. It's at Stuart Lynch at iOS Dev dot space, uh, and I have a website that's uh, Createx Solutions. So I don't know if you can provide a link in the yeah, in the, be, the notes. All the links will be the description to, to okay. everything. Um, because that's those are that's where. I post sort of my recent uh, my recent um, videos, the last ten or fifteen, and my apps and just other stuff that I'm doing. Um, you know, I have a couple of blog posts on there, but uh, probably YouTube and Mastodon or Twitter are probably the best places to get a hold of me. And I'm always my DMs are open, so I'm always uh, interested in, in talking to people. And if, uh, if there's some problems that they have, uh, I'm more than happy to see if I can help. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode. Make sure you guys like, comment, share, and subscribe. Make sure you share this with another developer. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Music, make sure you guys leave a review. Hit that little follow button. And actually, a new announcement is we now have a newsletter for the podcast. So definitely subscribe to that. And you'll be notified when each episode drops. And the newsletter will also have some nuggets of information that will help you on your journey as you're out there developing those apps. <laughs> so I'll see you all in the next one.